Um, yeah, so it's so good to see you. And uh, this is my last time preaching at ACC. It will be my, and not my last time being here. We have one more week. Uh, next Sunday will be the Henning's last Sunday. Now, it could very well be the case, and I hope to, exp I hope to visit um, in the future. And if the leadership thinks it would be helpful, I'm always happy to share from God's word. But as a member of ACC, this will be my last time here uh, preaching. We're planning on having an open house this Saturday, probably at Eagle Point Park. We're still figuring out those details. Um, but this is kind of uh, an emotional sermon for me. So as always, I ask that you pray for me as I preach, that I would speak with the authority of God's word and that I would listen carefully to the, to the Holy Scripture as we all would. This is also our last Sunday at Emmaus Bible College. Lord, may it be so. Um, and we will be at, um, at our new location in Tri-State next week. So for a couple different reasons, this is kind of a, a goodbye sermon. Um, Dan Foster has brought up Acts 20 a couple different times to me. And he's talked about, uh, you know, the scene in which people come around Paul and they cry over him that he has to leave. And, and they say, don't go because only certain death and imprisonment await you. Um, I don't think the future looks quite that grim from where I stand. Um, imagine with me, however, that this was your last goodbye message. Imagine with me, let's just change the setting a little bit. Imagine with me, you are going to write a, a letter to your church or a letter to your family knowing that your death was soon. And you are going to compose your final words. The final words of Dan Foster, whatever it was. What sort of topics would you want to go over? What would be like the last things? Your parting words of final wisdom. Listen, what you need to know is this. What would make the cut? Peter was in just that situation. And the result is 2 Peter. In uh, 114, we, know, we find out that he writes this letter knowing that, quote, the putting off of my body will be soon. And he writes it in light of what he calls his departure. Paul also was in just a situation. And the result is 2 Timothy. In both of these letters... We find a major concern within their parting words that, frankly, I'm not sure would have made the cut in most of our lists. In their final letters, both Paul and Peter devote a lot of space to warning against false teachers. 2 Peter 2 is particularly graphic in its denunciation a lot of gloomy darkness and chains and going to hell. And it's, it's one of the darkest parts of, well, the whole Bible, really. At first, it seems strange that they would wax so eloquent on the evils of apostasy and their final goodbyes. Why not talk about, like, the love of Christ or, or the, the, the supremacy of God in all things or something like that? Well, both Peter and Paul were teachers who firmly believed in the importance of what they did. They were Bible teachers. They were pastors, shepherds, who cared deeply about the flock of God. They cared about the church. And because of that, they were afraid that when they left the scene, they would be replaced with the wrong types of people. It's because they believed in what they did so much that in direct proportion, they hated 
what we could call spiritual malpractice. Last week, Abe, Abe gave us an excellent and much needed challenge to pay careful attention to the word of God. To, to, to pay attention to it is like a light that's shining in a dark place. He rightly pointed out that the, at reading the Bible is a spiritual enterprise. That's why talking to and counseling several college students and people in other stages of life, I find that it's pretty easy to wake up early to exercise, to make time for television, or even to study for an exam. But to carve out 15 minutes to spend with the Lord every day seems like there's just never the time. It's because it's a spiritual exercise, and we have a real enemy. Abe's message made me think of the famous quote by Charles Spurgeon. This book will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from this book. That's true. Amen? Sort of. It's true like the Proverbs are true. It's a good admonition, but you know, there's a lot of exceptions. Watch out for those exceptions. The Bible is a light, keeping us from sin and showing us the way to walk. But there were then, and there are now, those whose occupation it is to be fully invested in the Bible. They spend countless hours reading its pages. And yet, this only increases the amount of energy they need to expend to suppress its convicting power. They willfully reject the scripture's call to righteous living and use the Bible only for their own aims. Sadly, some people are often in the Bible, but the result is not. It, that it keeps them from sin. So I guess the big idea of our text in 2 Peter chapter 2 is watch out for exceptions to Abe's sermon. Watch out for when that isn't true. When people who are in the Bible, well, watch out for when there are people who are in the Bible, but it doesn't lead to a righteous lifestyle. Watch out for false teachers. Or to think of it another way, pick your leaders carefully. The application of this text is a little bit different uh, 2,000 years later. We have all sorts of leaders. Of course, there are the elders of this assembly here, but our leaders, our Bible teachers, are also uh, the songs that we listen to, the podcasts that are on our playlists, the books that we read. The sources of information that we feed ourselves. These are our leaders, our teachers. Watch out, because we will end up where they are going. So choose them carefully. So it's not a very sunshiny, heartwarming topic in front of us. But it's desperately needed by the Church of Jesus Christ. We've seen so many rise and fall so quickly within Christendom at large, century after century. Not uh, because there are genuine people who just fall and struggle with sin, but because they step into the, the spotlight to use the church for their own advantage. All right, so here's a brief overview of our passage. The text comes in four major sections. We have a brief overview of the threat of false teachers in verses 1 to 3a. And in the second half of verse 3 to 10, we have three examples from the Old Testament uh, to show that God knows how to judge false teachers, how, that God knows how to judge the ungodly. In 10b to 19, we have the motivation of these false teachers. And then lastly, we have a sobering warning about what's happening in 2.20 through 22. 
All right, let's begin by looking at how Peter introduces these false teachers. I think it's important to think through the importance of this, uh, this label, false teachers. I, we could put it in air quotes. It's not really a good expression. It, it's, it's a good translation of the Greek. It's just pseudo didaskaloi. It's just false teachers. And yet, what is a false teacher? Well, if I, had to, if I were to just ask you to throw out a definition, it wouldn't be fair to do this, because the definition that probably comes to most of our minds is, well, it would be people that, I guess, teach false things, false teachers. But a moment's reflection shows that that can't possibly be the case. If that was the case, then I'm a false teacher. Ben's a false teacher. We've only ever had false teachers on the, uh, up here behind the pulpit. And think about it this way. There, there's no way that any two preachers agree on every single thing. And you get them talking long enough, and they're going to disagree with each other. And when they're saying different things, at least one of them has to be wrong. Theoretically, they could both be wrong, but at least one of them is wrong. No, a false teacher is not somebody who simply is wrong on something and says it out loud. Instead, Peter describes it this way. These are people who bring in heresies of destruction. Now, the word heresy at the time of the composition of 2 Peter, it doesn't have the negative connotation uh, that it now has. We think of heresy. Well, obviously, nobody wants to say a heresy. But at the time, it's just a way of thinking, kind of like an idiosyncratic, a group. Um, however, what's wrong with it is, well, well, a couple things, is that it's brought in. It doesn't arise naturally or organically from apostolic preaching. It's alien, it's outside, and these teachers have brought it into the church. Of course, the dead giveaway that this is a bad thing is that he describes it as a heresy of destruction. It will destroy those who preach it and those who hear it. In fact, there's this uh, play on words. They bring in heresies of destruction and they bring on themselves swift destruction. Peter has in mind here people who bring in ideas which deny the master who bought them. As we'll go through this text, it'll become clear that this denial particularly regards the Lord's authority over a person's lifestyle. The word Lord here is actually where we get the word despot. Uh, it means a master or complete sovereign. So a lot of translations have the word master instead of Lord. It strongly emphasizes, again, is the complete authority. But the people's actions are doubly bad because not only do they deny the master, but they deny the master who bought them. Do you believe that Christ died for people who reject him? Do you believe that the work of atonement extends over those who will eventually have none of it and so experience the fate of what 2 Peter 2 describes? Peter describes these people as denying the Lord who bought them. And this doesn't fit well with the teaching of what some have called limited atonement, that Christ only died for the elect. In fact, it's important to allow for all of this in order to appreciate Peter's logic. What an egregious thing it is to know that Christ has died for your sin, that you do belong to him, that he owns you, and then to deny the right of way to the one who bought you with his own blood. So egregious is this that it brings swift destruction. And we'll return to this at the end when we get to that sobering warning about dogs and pigs who have escaped 
but then end up returning to their former estate. At this point, the main idea is to remember that the false teachers Peter addresses aren't just people who get some things wrong, but instead they, they deny Christ's rule over their lives. And they teach others to follow their example. As a result, Peter says, it is by them the way of truth will be blasphemed. Peter then moves on to describe their destruction in the next section in 2, 3b to 10. And again, he goes into some pretty, what I, I call gory details. And the reason for it isn't because he gets some sort of sadistic pleasure about talking about gloom and doom. It's because he's passionate about it. It's because Peter believes the danger is actually real. He can see it in front of him, and so he has to speak. He gets so vivid and graphic for a couple reasons. One is because it seems like these false teachers are still a part of the community. And so he expects that as this letter is read, they're going to hear these words. He says later on, uh, in verse 13, he talks about them as blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Feasting here is probably a reference to the, the love feast, uh, the celebration of communion. These people were sitting down with the saints at the Lord's table. So he wants to wake them up. Moreover, he uses this strong language about destruction because he sees that they're having some sort of an influence. They're not just sitting in a corner, doing nothing, staying to themselves. Verse 3 says, they exploit you with false words. So this sort of strong language is important, though many would label it as politically incorrect, because Peter is saying as loudly as possible, the road is closed, don't go down that way, turn around. Now, to prove his point, Peter gives three examples. Now, these three examples all start with the word if. And it's the kind of if as in like since. In other words, this is true. If this has happened, if this has happened, and if this has happened, and it all raises to a crescendo in verse 9. If all these things are true, then the Lord does know how to rescue the godly from trials and keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Okay, so let's go over a few of these examples. Um, the first one is a reference to Genesis 6 and the sons of God who came into the daughters of men. And the text of Genesis 6 is weird. Um, there's all sorts of gaps in it. If you go back and read it, you'll, you'll wait a minute. Let me read that again. That still doesn't make any sense. You'll probably read it a couple dozen times and then say, yeah, that's a weird passage. Um, in fact, other people noticed that it was weird, and so throughout history, various interpreters kind of filled in those gaps with what they thought was actually happening. The prevalent interpretation in the first century, found in all sorts of Jewish circles, was that uh, when Genesis 6 talks about the sons of God cohabitating with the daughters of, uh, the daughters of men, the result is there are these Nephilim, or fallen ones, these demonic creatures, that the sons of God were demons, fallen angels, who somehow uh, created these half-demonic, half-human beings. Uh, Josephus, the Pharisee uh, historian, writing about the time of Christ, writing about the same time as Peter, actually, uh, comments on the, the flood account in this way in his Antiquities of the Jews. Uh, he writes, For many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence they had in their own strength. For the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. This is all interesting. 
But Noah was very uneasy at what they did, and being displeased at their conduct, persuaded them to change their dispositions and their acts for the better. But seeing that they did not yield to him, but were slaves to their wicked pleasures, he was afraid they would kill him, together with his wife and children and those they had married, and so he departed out of that land. We're going to pick that up again. But this is especially interesting because it parallels the Greek story of the Titans, who are then consigned uh, for their heinous acts to a special place in Hades called Tartarus, if you're familiar with Greek history. And in fact, we don't get the normal word for hell in, in 2 Peter 2. In fact, the word for hell, you might have like a little footnote in your Bible, it's actually the word for Tartarus. All that to say, 2 Peter 2 gives us like the tip of the iceberg. And when you dive below the surface and start exploring, what's going on here with these angels and the gloom of darkness and the chains and the pit? It turns out that this iceberg is really, really huge. And if you're a Bible nerd like me, it's a lot of fun to get on your scuba gear and try to swim around down there and figure out exactly what's going on. <sighs> okay, I don't have a whole lot of time, so I got to press forward. Uh, do we need to believe in all that stuff? Well, the Bible is the inspired word of God. The doctrine of inspiration means that we as Christians should believe whatever the Bible teaches. Amen? Amen. Amen. But we don't need to affirm everything which Peter may or may not have thought, but only what he wrote down in inspired scripture. So although I think Peter probably does buy into a lot of this stuff that I was just talking about, what he wrote down is that there were angels who did sin. And this is what's going on in Genesis 6. And so we are kind of locked into at least that much. Peter moves along to the very next story in Genesis, the flood. In fact, he'll return to this in chapter 3, verses 5 to 6, about the world being destroyed by water. Uh, like the example with the angels in Tartarus, this is an example when God stepped into human history and gave a preview of the coming judgment. It's like people wonder, is hell real? I mean, does God, like, actually have the guts to follow through on the threat? How are we going to know? Well, he's given us a lot of sneak peeks that he is a God of judgment and that he does follow through on his, punish on his, on his promises of punishment. The angels are one in Genesis 6, so is the flood. Again, this is why I read specifically from Josephus. We could have read from all sorts of different things. Um, I read from Josephus because he specifically shows Noah as a herald or a preacher of righteousness. You don't really get that if you just read the biblical account. Um, evidently, Peter is saying to us that Noah preached to the world around him. But they constantly rejected it. In a similar way, these false preachers are immersed in the convicting work of reading God's word again and again and again. And day after day, they have to say no to the Holy Spirit. That does something to a person's soul. As it did to the antediluvians, to the people who were alive before the flood. Just uh, The false teachers, just like the people in Noah's day, they tried to call God's bluff. God doesn't mean it. Pfft, rain. Why are you building a boat way out here in the middle of nowhere? It's useless. Oh, God told you there's going to be punishment. Likely story. Uh, there are a lot of similarities between 2 Peter, actually, and the book of Jude. Uh, so much so that scholarship sees 2 Peter 2 as a reworking of that whole letter. Now, Jude also mentions the angels who sin, and it also mentions uh, these eternal chains, and then it moves straight into the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. 2 Peter adds the example of Noah to the mix, which Jude does not have. 2 Peter also stresses Lot's actions in contrast to Jude, because he wants to say something a little bit different. Uh, Jude's point is more that, listen, punishment is real. And, and, and Peter wants to keep that, but he also wants to add to it, but there were also good guys. 
and God knows how to save them. If you go back to the book of Genesis and you start comparing the stories of Noah and Lot, there's a surprising amount of similarity. Okay, I know you don't want to hear this, but this is good homework to go home and read the story of Noah and read the story of Lot. It's fascinating to compare them. They're both saved out of cataclysmic judgment, and yet after they're saved, they have this strange sexual encounter with people in their family because of drunkenness. Again, it's a very strange, at least PG-13 story. All that to say, Noah and Lot are far, far from perfect people. They are thoroughly flawed characters. So when the Bible calls them righteous, it's not because they were like these saints hovering above the ground with halos behind their head. They had some serious problems. And yet, they are righteous. They trusted in God. But notice the way that they're described. Noah is a preacher of righteousness, and Lot was distressed by the actions which he saw. You get this if you read the account carefully. Remember when the people come and they beat down uh, Lot's door? And Lot goes out and tries to restrain them. He says, no, 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 don't do this. That's disgusting. And, and, and the people respond to Lot by saying, who made you a judge over us? He had a reputation for disagreeing with their sinful practices. They are righteous. Uh, Peter's idea here is not so much that they have the imputed righteousness of Christ or the righteousness of justification, true as though that may be. Uh, instead, Peter's point is that these were righteous people because they stood against the tide of unrighteousness that was swirling around them. Even though it may be hard for us to read it in the biblical text, they stood up against the world and said, no, that's wrong. These are some strange stories from the book of Genesis. Stranger still in light of the prevalent first century Jewish interpretation. But these stories are entirely relevant for us. I hope you read the story about the sons of God and the daughters of men. And you read the stories of Noah and Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah and you say, that's exactly what we need to hear. Our culture is embodied by Lot's sons-in-law who hear the message of judgment and do you remember what they think? They think he was only joking. Where preachers who copy the words of John the Baptist flee from the wrath to come are portrayed as the butt end of the joke on TV shows and on movies. As Peter looks on the scene and anticipates his departure, he knows that the furtherance of the church depends on faithfulness to the gospel message. That those inside who downplay the realities of sin and the coming judgment will only bring greater judgment on themselves. So, brothers and sisters, as we're in a period of transition, like Peter was at the end of his life, Looking forward to the future, it is vital that we keep preaching against sin. That we do not flirt with it or play with it, but take it as real. Why would a person downplay sin anyway? What kind of a Bible teacher is that? What would motivate a false teacher? Well, we get that in the next section, 10b to 19. For the sake of time, let me just bring out a couple things. Um, one is their inflated ego. The word blasphemy occurs often in this section. They are the sorts of people who like to get up in front of others and use demeaning speech. They exalt themselves by putting all others down. In fact, we don't have the time to get into it, but they, they do so by blaspheming the glorious ones, probably a reference to angelic beings. 
pretending like they are some sort of great spiritual leaders in spiritual warfare. Watch out for leaders, wherever they may be, with inflated egos. Watch out when leaders always get their way. It's a bad sign. who have bombastic preaching, who, who are full of their own authority. Chances are the reason is because they don't want to submit to the authority of Christ who bought them. The second motivation for these false teachers is in the next section, um, here in 2.13b to 16. This is where the, he brings up Balaam and, and the story of Balak. Uh, this is a fascinating story in which, you remember, the, remember it? King Balak wants to uh, bring down a curse on, on the people of Israel, and so he hires this false prophet. He says, curse the people of Israel for me. He says, all right, I'll do my thing at a price. And so uh, he tries to curse the people of Israel, but when he gets into his trance and starts to prophesy, God overrules and he can only say what is good. He tries it again and again and again, looking for a loophole until he has a brilliant idea. He realizes that a front door approach isn't going to work. He can't directly curse the people of God. And so what he does is he gets the people to be interested in the Moabite women. And he gets the people to compromise themselves. And through their sexual promiscuity and participation in their pagan practices, they bring the curse of God upon their own heads. Part of the appeal of false teachers is not only do they want to justify their own sinful lusts, but they also play in the desire for their audience to do the same. Peter ends this section with a sobering warning. Let's read it again, starting in verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has returned to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. This is a gross way to end a passage of scripture. Have you ever seen this happen? You might think, if you know me, you might think that I have two dogs, so I must love dogs. I have two dogs because I love my wife. I do not like dogs. Um, if, you, if you're looking for reasons to not like dogs, you watch them do this and they'll actually do it. Or they'll vomit walk away, and then turn, turn around and go, what's that delightful smell? And they'll come back and eat it. In the same way, these false preachers, they've, they've left the contamination of sin, and then after a while, it starts to appeal to them. Now, immediately, the question surfaces. Have these people lost their salvation? Is that what Peter is trying to say? Well, it's 1026. It's time for me to close. Um, no, let me, let me point out a few things here as I uh, squeeze in in my time. Um, well, let me just point out some obvious things. It's more important to be faithful to the text than it is to bolster a system of theology. A few observations. These people really escaped. They really did. And they escaped through the knowledge of Christ. They really did know the Lord Jesus Christ. They really did know the way of righteousness. In other words, they actually left something good. Second, the text specifies they escaped the defilement of the world. They had some moral purification that actually happened. There was some sort of reformation in their life. Now, 
that doesn't necessarily have to be the same thing as what Paul calls justification. Or what we read in John 3 as being born again. Third, they are described as pigs and dogs who return. And this may indicate that they are revealing their true nature in due time. We want to be careful to not read too much of Paul's theology into Peter and transfer categories which Paul isn't using. Instead, it's important to track with Peter's line of thinking. They started well, yes, but they didn't finish. They started on the path of righteousness, but they didn't keep going. Which is better? To start on the path of righteousness and then quit or to never begin in the first place. Well, you've got your Bibles open, don't you? He says it's better to just never have started. Now, all of that is not meant to scare people like, okay, so don't start. Uh, and instead, what the, what the idea is, is listen, you have to finish the course. Retreat is not an option. Do not follow the false teachers. You do not want to end up where they are taking people. This is a fascinating way to end the passage because for a long time, Peter has been pointing his finger. But in, in, in bringing up this point about a genuine experience and uh, starting well but not finishing well, he's also then pointing the finger at all of his audience. And he's pointing the audience at anyone who has a, had a genuine start. The effect of the text is to say, make sure that you finish well. You know, however you want to live your life, Whatever your dream life is, you say, this is the good life. I want to be with this kind of a person, with this kind of a gender, and I want to live in this kind of a way and in this kind of a house, doing these sorts of things. You can find a group of people who will say that's good. And if you want to have the Bible in there and Jesus in there, you will find a group of people who will allow you to do that. There have always been and until the Lord returns, there will always be false teachers who justify immorality and godlessness somehow using the Bible. Watch out for fake Christianity. One that talks much about the Bible, but in word or practice denies the master who bought them. I'm speaking now as a leader or a person who's had the privilege to be in a sort of leadership role here at ACC. On the one hand, this text really emphasizes the dangers of bad leadership. But the application to make cannot be, so don't have leaders. <laughs> leaders can go bad, so don't have them. That's not the application. If false teachers are bad, it means we need good teachers. If false, corrupt elders are a problem, the implication is that there's a dire need for good ones. For those of you who are already called into that, take it seriously to lead the flock by your own example, to lead in humility to lead in righteousness, to lead in genuine care for the flock. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the seriousness of your word. This is a really cool passage of the Bible, and I've enjoyed studying it, and there are so many little rabbit holes that we didn't get the chance to go into and explore. But Father, may we not miss the big point that broad is the path which leads to destruction. There are many on it. 
may we stay on the straight and narrow path. May we not deny the Lord who bought us. We are his. We cannot do what we want. May we be like Lot, who was vexed in his righteous soul when he saw the wickedness of the world around him. Keep us, O oh God, from returning to the vomit, from wallowing in the mire. Keep us from promises of freedom, which are actually slavery. May we follow the Lord Jesus as a church, faithfully and completely. We ask these things 